Suge Knight stands in front of me with a gun in his waistband. He just pulls out big old 45 and just starts shooting out my window. Suge's already in the room. Did I see guns? Yes. Everybody on death row was walking around with a bulletproof vest on. It was a part of gangster rap. I said, Suge, they're afraid to do business with you. Hey, Lab said, yeah, man, isn't that great? <laughs> I was contacted on two occasions by friends of Suge Knight, and I was asked if I would be willing to defend him, and I refused. He was firing lawyers left and right. Uh, he looked unstable, and I said to myself, why do I need this? And I realized that I was not doing what my values told me I should do. You can't judge a book by its cover. So I was approached a third time and I agreed to meet with him. Music mogul Suge Knight is being held tonight on $2 million bail, accused of a fatal hit and run. Police say he ran over two men following an argument on a film set in Compton, California. One of the victims died. Knight's attorney says he was attacked and he was trying to escape in his truck when the incident took place. Knight, the co-founder of Death Row Records, previously served multiple years in prison for assault. I met Suge Knight in Los Angeles County Jail, which may be the worst jail in America. Four sheriffs follow him into the cubicle where I meet with him. They videotape every move he makes. He was handcuffed to the table. He's behind glass. We talked, and I found out that he is not at all the Suge Knight that is portrayed in the media, that he is a person who's complicated, very bright, did very well in school, was a star athlete. He's a very talented genius of a person. Suge's greatest skill was his ability to see talent in the rough. That ability to see what talent can become as opposed to what it is right now, that's a rare talent. In the music industry, there are very few people who have that talent. He was the smart kid on the block, and that's part of how he was able to attract some talent because, you know, here's a kid who's from Compton, but he went to college. I think the first time I met Suge Knight was in the Solar offices. Solar Records was the most successful black label of the 80s. I actually thought of him as a big teddy bear. He's called him Baby Huey tried to help him understand a lot about how the business worked, what some of the legal deals were. He was like a sponge. I was writing these records and it was blowing up in California. I met you as soon as I got here. We'd been bodyguarding for Bobby Brown for some time. And when we would go places, he would play the role of bodyguard and I would play the role of star and we'd get in and have fun. <laughs> we got banned, bro, from every club. Cause Shug was, a, he was a deviant. Shug always had guns at my house. You know, big street sweepers with the Tommy gun thing on it and cool little dead as Desert Eagles and 45 Magnums. And so I just rolled like that. The first time I met Suge Knight, he came in as the DOC's bodyguard. His arm was in a cast, you know, from some fight that he got into. I think Suge was just kind of biding his time and waiting for the right opportunity. And he saw, you know, the big money wasn't in bodyguard. It was in management. It was in owning a record label. Suge had started managing acts. He brought Mario Johnson. Ice Ice Baby was all over the radio and stuff. And he said, he wrote those songs and can you help us get paid?
I wrote Ice Ice Baby when I was 16 years old. I never could imagine the, the type of success I was going to have. I sold 160 million records. We were selling a million records a day. When it blew up, I was 19. And at that point, everybody realized, he's white? What? <laughs> and they're already jamming to Ice Ice Baby. It's all over radio, number one, everywhere. I think my record had sold like 4 million, 5 million copies or something like that at that point, which is only like a week into it. <laughs> Crazy. Hey, I'm doing good, man. So I'm going to Benihana's for dinner, and I sit down, I order, and then uh, before the food gets there, we had our appetizers there. This big guy walks up. He says, hey, I'm Suge Knight. He says, let me talk to you for a minute. Ice, if you got a second, let me just talk to you. I says, okay, yeah. He starts eating some of my fries or whatever I'm eating there. Yeah, okay, all right, I can order more. No big deal. He didn't give me an explanation or anything at that point. He just says, hi, I'm Suge Knight, and I'm just nice to know you. I didn't even think much from it other than that was, you know, why would they come, somebody come in and sit down and say hello to me just to introduce themselves? A little time had passed, maybe three weeks to a month. I go back, I check into a hotel in LA, somewhere close to the Beverly Center there. I'm with my DJ, Earthquake, and two bodyguards. I walk in the room, pull the key out, and I look in there and Suge's already in the room with about five other guys. And I'm like, whoa. And he goes, hey, don't be alarmed, come on in. Suge did tell my bodyguards to shut the F up and just stand over in the back. Did I see guns? Yes, many of them. Suge just says, you know, Rob, me and you, let's go to the balcony and talk. And he brings a stack of papers, about 300 papers thick. The story that has been told is that I was hung over a balcony, which never happened. He didn't hang me over the balcony. He took me to the balcony to talk to me. I got it, you don't have to hang me over. I didn't want to question that or test that water, so to speak. <laughs> it looked like it was freezing uh, and there was ice crystals floating across of it, so I didn't want to jump right in. You see what I'm saying? It's not, didn't look like a hot tub to me. So I signed the pieces of paper there and it, it allowed him to have a few points on the record to the extreme, which turned out to be worth millions of dollars. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I'm young, I'm 19, you know. Then I start thinking back on things and going, hmm, so that was all about the money for Shug, okay. And then I saw the Chronic record pop up and Tupac and all this, and I knew the funding came from my record. So I'm happy to invest in that. Even with no return on my money, I have a story to tell that I've invested in some of the greatest hip hop of all time. And I figured this is the price I gotta pay to just be a part of something that's elite in a rap industry. We gave Mario Johnson $400,000 advance. Suge's deal is he got a 25% management fee. So he made $100,000 off that advance, the most money he'd ever made. He came back, must have been a couple weeks later, and says, I got another client. He brought in uh, Doc and Dre. No one could do it better. Came out, it made a huge splash. Like, oh my God, this is the next guy. You know, I, I made it to that position. The DOC was the greatest solo rapper we ever heard or saw, and writer. I mean, he was really amazing. And he was like a ghostwriter for NWA. I put a lot of work in, a lot of energy on those records. But I wasn't getting anything, you know? So sure, kept beefing about your publishing and they doing this and they doing that. He said, get your contracts, I'm gonna take a look at them. Saw all the holes, saw all the, the, the dirtiness that was going on. And so I, I took that to Dre and said, uh, look, if they're doing me like this, they could be doing you like this. Well, that got Dre interested and we started talking about making a, a record label you know, together. And Dre and I could finally benefit from our hard work. Suge walks into my office, closes the door behind him, stands in front of me with a gun in his waistband, you know, which is right about eye level to me because I'm sitting here. He says, Gary, you've been disrespecting Dr. Dre and the DOC. I said, hey, Suge, I do everything for them. I don't want to hear that. I want you to sign a letter saying you're never going to disrespect them again. You know what I'm going to do if you don't do that. And the way he said that, I didn't even want to take a chance. So I write on a piece of ruthless stationery. I will never disrespect Dr. Dre and the DOC. I was in front of Suge Knight and really, 
in, in, in serious fear. She was like a friend, right? Someone that I could trust and depend on to help me make proper moves. So I focused on building uh, something with him. We can make something bigger than Ruthless, hopefully make something bigger than Motown or wherever else out there together. Let's just start fresh. Yo, what's up, what's up, what's up? My name's Dr. Dre, I'm in the house. Suge convinced Dr. Dre that he'd be better off leaving Ruthless and starting a company with Suge. You know, and Suge basically said, you take care of the music, I'll take care of the business, and, you know, I'll take care of it my way. You know, which he did. He did it his way. Let me see somebody give Dre, Suge, the DOC, a round of applause. Death Row Records is going to be the record company of the 2000s. Death Row is annihilating any other label in this music business. We're giving all the youngsters the opportunity from all the neighborhoods, well, basically, we haven't forgot where we came from. The first time that I met Suge Knight, this big old dude walked in the door. He looked like a giant, chest all pumped out, earrings in his ears, and big old cigar. And Suge was like, bust him. He thought that I was a rapper. And I began to sing him. Uh, Amazing, zing grace. He was like, man, I want him right now. <laughs> right now, signing him. 200 and, I think he said 250000 $275,000. He made an offer immediately. And uh, from that day on, it was Danny Boy a part of Death Row, which was really amazing and crazy because I was only 15 years old. Suge put me in the Peninsula Hotel, and he put me in this plushed out room and gave me a credit card. I had access to this Rolls Royce limousine. It was incredible, <laughs> for sure. At that time, no other CEOs of big record labels was really close to their artists, such as Suge was. Making sure that they were living okay. Making sure that you know we look like stars was this thing. You gotta look like a star. That boy gonna be the first uh, R&B act on your label? Yeah. yeah buddy. I wanna say he's 16, but he had a birthday a couple of days ago. Oh, okay. I was like the the soul child. You know, he was he was really ready to put a lot into me in order for me to work here, work in Los Angeles. Being a minor, I had to have a guardian. He kind of sat down. He's like, man, you know. You like my son anyway, you know, so we might as well go ahead and, you know, make this happen. And he, spoke, he spoke with my, my grandmother and my, my, my dad, and uh, he became my legal guardian uh, at that point. I swear you give me so high, yeah, yeah. If you think about the roster of death row artists, should really help popularize another sound. You know, Death Row sound was different than the, than the East Coast sound of rap music. And they sold tens of millions of records. So that had the effect of really legitimizing that art form. I became involved in the investigation of Death Row Records as a result of a large federal racketeering case that the FBI and the ATF had initiated back in the uh, mid-1990s. After they had received reports that the initial investment money for Death Row Records uh, had come from an individual named Michael Harris, and the seed money was essentially narcotics proceeds. Michael was like a real godfather, you know. He was reputed to have run one of the largest drug distribution rings in the country. He was a legend on the streets and someone that Suge wanted to be like. First of all, rap music's always kind of been gangster, okay? Let's just call it like it is. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that are pushing things, that are making things happen. And it travels through a lot of gangsterish type of 
personalities, to say the least. We all know that. I'm going to beat the dog out of you. And I swear to y'all, it's like this. I'm the first at the ball head in the beer from Bob. Suge Knight was a very powerful guy in many ways. Powerful in a business venture type way and powerful in a gangster type way. <laughs> so uh, he's somebody you didn't want to mess with. I knew that. He was hiring real gang members and he could be the boss of that gang. And I said, Suge, you know, I have a friend at Sony, and they say that when people, you know, talk to you, you know, you're scaring them and, and they're afraid to do business with you. And he <laughs> sat back and he laughed. He said, yeah, man, isn't that great? Ha, 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 ha. The more people thought that he was gangster, the more he started to believe in himself. You know what I mean? We sit up and watch him. Watch all them, the Godfather movies, and oh my God, I think they got to see them movies. He's really like, I'm, I'm the man, huh? Like, I think that kind of really pumped him up, <laughs> so to say. So he started living that image, man. It was like the wild, wild west. Our secretaries had guns. We had shotguns in the corner. We had Uzis. And, you know, it was, it was insane. Right now, we're at the house where Sugar grew up in the city of Compton. This is the house where he had most of his uh, childhood at. I was in the second grade, he was in the third grade. Suge and I later went to high school together. He was on the football team as well. He was a big guy, but this is a guy that could do a backflip, standing up. I always tell people that Suge was the same. He always was a, a bully. He was a mama boy. He didn't mess with Suge. When I met Suge, I was really young, and we was at a house party, and this guy kept interfering with everything I did, no matter who I danced with, no matter who I talked with. He was in the middle of it, like he was my boyfriend. He was owning this piece of property. I get to asking him his name, and he said, Suge, I said, no, son, that is not your name. What is your real name? He said, Myron at first, and so I was believing it was Myron until I really looked into it, and it's Marion, not Myron, no why, it's Marion. Parents loved him, my mother loved him. He was like my knight in shining armor. We knew we were gonna get married. He had a lot of offers to different universities to play football. All I knew was Shu was going to be a professional football player. He did get an offer with the 49ers, and he did play for the Rams when they went on strike. All of a sudden, I get this phone call, and he tells me that he's in trouble. And I'm like, well, what happened? He says, well, I shot my friend. The football thing was not there anymore. It was all about bodyguarding and being a manager and to being CEO of Death Row Records. I began working on the streets in South Central in 1989. I became a member of an elite gang fighting unit called Crash. Gang violence on the street was very prevalent. Murders were an everyday occasion. It was always about neighborhoods, and from the gang's perspective, they thought that they were protecting their neighborhoods. In Los Angeles, there's criteria that we use to qualify somebody as a gang member. Style of dress, tattoos, other gang members identifying you. Many of those components Suge Knight uh, fulfilled. He would dress in all red. He surrounded himself with known gang members. You would qualify him as a gang member. Chug grew up in a blood neighborhood. He was a blood. Everybody knows who the blood and who's a crip. I care about the ghetto. I don't love the ghetto. That's where I'm from. That's who need to help. I mean, I'm not part of the letting the rich get richer and the poor get poor. So I'm definitely going to go back to those ghettos. And I'm definitely going to give back. Sharitha was pregnant. Chug and I are going to see her at a doctor's appointment. And we're at a stop sign. And she leans over and tells me to let, lay my seat back and lean back. And he just pulls out big old 45 and just starts shooting out my window. Hot shells popping on me and I'm like, what the f you know? It was pretty shocking. Not even a mile up the street, we're at our doctor's thing. We part 
and he getting out of the car like it was nothing. But I was starting to develop in my mind that this guy has really bad news, like it's bad karma, like this has nothing to do with what we're supposed to be doing. He just changed his ego, his temper. The women started flocking the money, and that was basically the demise of our marriage. She got out of control. It was like the wild, wild west. Everybody had guns. Uh, they had guns, we had guns, our secretaries had guns. We had shotguns in the corner, we had Uzis. Hey, you know, it was, it was insane. As time went on, you start seeing new faces. It was taking on sort of a harder edge, you know, security, you know, and the security would be blood dudes. It was no secret that he hired most of the guys from his neighborhood that probably had done 10, 15 years in jail. You know, we doing records, but these are some crazy ass dudes around here. Yeah, you kind of knew that. You felt it. I mean, shoot, initially started off as being a bruiser. And I'm not gonna put a halo over his head to say that he never have slapped someone or lost his temper and stuff like that, because that has happened. And that has happened frequently. Once he became CEO, he did have a crew that will have you taken care of as needed. They came into my office with this guy and gave him the business like you would not believe, you know? And the guy was screaming my name, begging me to, to make them stop as if I had the power to do that. And sat there and watched him um, beat this guy nuts, you know? We were death row, not only just in name, but in energy around that place. Sugar and I had a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation. It was just Sugar and I that night, and he was sitting there cleaning this little 380, silver 380. It was a nice, great-looking gun. And in so many words, he let me know, I'm going this way, I'm building this thing, and this is what's going on. And don't rock the boat, bro. You don't want to do that. He never said anything directly menacing to me, but I got it. And as he was leaving, he gave me the, the 380. Said, it's dangerous out here, take care of yourself. It was easy for me to see I had been written out of history. The first award for producer of the year goes to Dr. Dre. I gotta give a shout out to my homie Big Sure for paving the way so I can make my music. Wait, wait, wait. The East Coast don't love Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg? The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row? We know y'all East Coast. We know we at. It wasn't an East Coast, West Coast thing. It was a Puffy and Suge problem. That's what it was. And one other thing I'd like to say, any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't want to, want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, cover death row. It's an affront to Puffy right there who's sitting in the audience. You know, it's obviously this very confrontational and disrespectful thing to do, and that just fuels the fire that's already brewing between these crews. In 1995, a close friend of Suge Knight's, who was his bodyguard, was at a nightclub where Sean Puffy Combs and members of his entourage were. There was a little bit of a beef inside of the nightclub, and one of the people in Sean Combs' entourage pulled out a gun and shot and killed Suge's friend. Well, now there's blood on the ground. A person very close to Suge Knight has been murdered, and he's holding Puffy responsible for it. Tupac Shakur was shot five times the day before he was convicted of sex abuse in New York. The crime was officially classified as a robbery, and the police dropped their investigation when Tupac failed to cooperate. Pac just felt like 
Puffy had a lot to do with him being shot. That was something that he felt strong about. You from the streets, you kind of know things and you hear things. And everybody was just riding with him on that. We rode with him on it. I heard Pac got shot up in New York. I shot him a bulletproof vest with the Death Row logo on it. Tell my yeah, you know, you know, lick your wounds, suck it up, tighten up your boots, you know what I mean? For Suge Knight, he's already got his, you know, pre-standing issues with Puffy Combs. So now having Tupac Shakur, who feels the same way, you've got these individuals who are now supporting each other in this conflict. Tupac was signed Interscope. They had this rap artist they didn't know what to do with. They said, Suge, can you do something? We'll be willing to give up our rights, let you take him. I seen Suge planning the great things that he wanted to do with Pop. Man, it's gonna be one of the greatest rappers of all time. Tupac Shakur has been sentenced to a maximum of four and a half years in prison for sexually abusing a fan. Shakur has been arrested six times since 1993 on charges ranging from assault to gun possession. He was sitting in jail and it was Suge who said, I will get him out of jail because I know what he can be. Suge Knight makes a deal to him. If we can arrange for you to get released from prison, if we put up the money for bail and you sign a recording contract with us, we'll get you out, you come out to death row, you know, we'll make music together. You know, we would go to New York and we would drive two, three hours down to this prison. I would be out there for hours at a time, sitting in that restaurant while Suge was in the jail. And I went about four or five times. And that last time is when we bought him home. Suge went and got him with a private jet, private car, pay for him, that was it. Craziest party in air. About 10 strippers, about two, three ounces of Kush, <laughs> weed, <laughs> nice little trip. We pulled up to k and Studios. Pac got out of his car, and he walked about five feet. Flat face, hit the ground. I remember him putting water on him, and he like, I'm straight. He's ready to go to the, <laughs> going to the studio. And from that day on, Pac never left the studio. We put it together. Yeah. Okay. Who producing that, Pac? No, it's me and uh, Jose Puente. Yeah, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the day I met Tupac. I went to his house and I said, Tupac, I just have to ask you. You know you sold yourself to the, to the devil, right? He said, this man, I don't care what nobody say about him, he's the only one that came to prison to get me out of prison. He's done everything he said in that jail cell and told me he was going to do for me and what I wanted. He has done it. Pac was on a whole nother level. When we went to go do work, we did work. When we played, we played hard. When we fought, we fought hard. Everything we did, we did it to the fullest. Tupac elevated the havoc. Tupac hated people, and we were supposed to hate people because Tupac hated them. That all these people talking about an East Coast, West Coast war, they like the Judas was to Jesus. They only here to cause confusion. All these suckers, they battling off of East and West like this is a game. This ain't no game. If this was chess, we'd be yelling checkmate three years ago. When Tupac came in, the picture of death row, it all just crumbled. During my investigation, I became aware of another event that had taken place in December of 1995. Death Row had hosted a Christmas party up in the Hollywood Hills. And during this party, an associate of Puffy Combs had essentially been kidnapped into one of the rooms where Suge Knight, Tupac Shakur, and several members of Suge's gang entourage I literally beat the hell out of this guy. He almost lost one of his eyes. It was events like this that caused Puffy Combs to realize that when he comes out to the West Coast to promote music or conduct business, he was going to need street level protection. He connected with a Southside Crip gang crew that began to do homeboy security for Bad Boy Records when they were out in Los Angeles. It was serious, that whole, you know, Suge not liking Puffy at the time, and just about everybody on death row was walking around with a bulletproof vest on every day. Bulletproof vest was a part of my makeup. It was a part of gangster rap. 
always had security around us, but in Vegas, you could be a little more relaxed. During that time, Suge, Pac, and myself was together all the time. And if I wasn't with them, they'll call me and tell me to meet them where they at. Pac missed the whole fight because Tyson had knocked the dude out so fast. I called Suge, he like, man, Tyson had knocked him out already. Meet us, we're gonna meet you at the club. And there was a little scuffle that took place between members of the Southside Crips and Death Row. And there was a back and forth uh, challenge where Suge Knight says, that we're untouchable. And uh, the Crip responds, you can be touched. And Tupac takes it upon himself to rush over and sucker punch the guy. And then the rest of the Death Row entourage join in. Still remember it like it just happened yesterday. I was in the club waiting for Suge and Tupac arrival when two guys from the entourage, the homeboy security, came up to me and said, hey, Suge's just been shot. When Tupac has just been shot down the street. I got a phone call in the middle of the night saying Suge and Tupac got shot up. To tell a kid your dad died is, is not something I was looking forward to. I got on the first flight that took us out to Vegas. I went straight to the hospital and I went in Suge's room. Suge had a little blood on him where he had got fragments of bullets that pierced his skull and in parts of his body. And then I went to go see Tupac and it was horrifying. He was laying on the table and it, it was it was horrible. Horrible. Well, yeah, a lot of emotions was running through me at the time. Two guys that I'm really in charge of their protection is laying in the hospital, fighting for their life. About four days after Pac was shot, Suge and I was at the Luxor Hotel. He had a cigar in his mouth. His tears was just running down his face. That was one of those times that stood out where I was able to see Suge for his heart, see the, 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 the emotional Suge. Suge went into a shell, like, you know, when you think you got money, you think money almost can fix anything. And uh, me being a little naive that this is something that Sure can't fix. It was a dark cloud because everybody hated to see Pac going through such a thing. And Suge and Pac was like brothers. Rapper Tupac Shakur has died in Las Vegas. Hours before that fatal drive-by, a security camera caught Knight taking part in an assault at a Las Vegas casino. That incident constituted a parole violation stemming from a 1994 assault conviction and sent Knight to jail. Reviewing the video, I noticed that Suge Knight actively participates in the beatdown. He participates in the assault, so clearly that's a violation of his probation. It's a crime in and of itself. However, the, um, the sentence probably didn't fit the crime in that particular incident. You know, he's sent away for eight years for a couple of kicks. And I'm looking at a long list of failures to follow court orders. I mean, I'm, I don't have any problem with the system, but we're not supposed to put people in jail for that in America, I don't think. On the night of March 9th of 1997, Biggie Smalls had returned to Los Angeles to promote his newest album, along with Sean Combs and his junior mafia entourage. They attend a after award show at the Peterson Auto Museum. And as Biggie Smalls and the rest of the entourage are leaving, a vehicle pulls up alongside the Suburban that Biggie's in. 
and a lone occupant of that car leans out the window and opens fire. Notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Smalls. His murder early Sunday morning in Los Angeles ignited speculation that it was a result of a long-standing East Coast, West Coast feud among rap artists. Through a process of elimination, we were able to disprove several theories about who had killed Biggie Smalls. And so that really only left us with the one plausible explanation. So we began to look very hard at Suge Knight and who his circle of friends might be that had retaliated for the murder of Tupac Shakur earlier. It's important to understand the gang mentality of Suge Knight. You know, he doesn't trust that the cops are gonna go out there and solve a crime. Gang members, they want immediate justice, and they want justice that they can see. And essentially, it's an eye for an eye system. And so to answer for the murder of Tupac Shakur, somebody's going to have to die. If anybody do anything, you got to realize one thing. It's up to God to make those decisions. So it's not up to me, it's not up to you. We don't want to take the law in our own hands, right? I think Suge did what Suge thought Suge had to do. Now Suge's locked up. My check started not coming on time. Then it went from not coming on time to not coming at all. They took the car. I never seen the car again. And they sent me account ledgers, hamburgers, Christmas gift, Danny Boy car for his birthday. And I went to the third page. My mother's funeral expense was on there, highlighted. You sending me these papers telling me I owe you for my mother's service? I finally got a chance to go to the prison and see him. St. Louis Obispo, we went and walked the yard. And he was telling me, you know, that different people was telling him I said, you know, Suge and Death Row. I'm like, really? You listen? You know, and he laughed and all y'all know. And he tried to point the finger at everybody else. But I knew it was him because when I left, everything remained the same. And now I'm at a point I have to think of good things to say. Cover up the that he did. I looked at him as a father, as a brother. How can you be sad for somebody that's you over? And such a good thing up. Never after been six years. I'm gonna have a drink with everybody today. Suge wasn't there. You're talking about five years of Suge not running Death Row. The picture of Death Row, it all just crumbled. Everybody was leaving. So Dre called me and he was like, I'm not doing anything for Suge anymore. I'm tired. I'm tired of the mess going on over here. I made quite a few mistakes, actually, picking the people I wanted to do business with. I've just been trying to put together a new family and um, basically just start all over. Suge lost everything he worked so hard to have. He lost it over just being selfish and stupid. You can only blaze a dusty road for so long before you have to turn around and go back down it and go, can't see anything. It catches up to you, doesn't it? You're going down a dusty road in a car and you stop, what happens? The dust comes over and goes right over the car. Kind of what happened with Suge. Everything changed, and I think he was stuck back in the 90s. People took Pac and Biggie dying really serious in the industry. Hey, well, let's not do no more shoot him up bang bang. I conducted hours of physical surveillance on Suge Knight, and to see that big, hulking, intimidating man walking with so much arrogance and confidence, and they're completely oblivious to the fact that 10 feet from them is an investigator who knows all of their moves, it, it kind of gives you a feeling of superiority. 
Some 175 heavily armed members of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department served 15 search warrants. Knight's lawyer told CNN that Knight is mystified by the events. Law enforcement was desperate to get Suge off the streets. Uh, there was so much violence going on surrounding death row, so many assaults, so many reports of extortion. We always knew the FBI was following us or trying to get us for something. But we figured, hey, we wasn't doing anything. So we didn't, we really didn't care. Should have more lawsuits on the table than anybody I know. Somebody did not pay his, I think it was $11 million in taxes. So from the lawsuits, the taxes, the only choice he had was to file bankruptcy. So much of his former self no longer exists. He's lost the type of influence that he once had on the street that money brings. He's a shell of a man. This is a guy that was broken down by the government. Had probably a million dollars a month, scraping up four or five thousand dollars a month just to survive. He's taken a mighty fall. There was a point in time when he was making a lot of money. I mean, you know, literally tens of millions of dollars a year, and he needed some money. And I thought, I said, well, you know, I, I don't have any money. He goes to a film site where they're shooting the NWA movie. I think he may have gone there to, you know, try and get some money out of Dre. He feels, hey, Dre, if it wasn't for me, you never would have been free. You never would have gotten to the place you are now. You, you're a billionaire. I'm struggling. You should give me some money. He shows up, and apparently one of the guys started to fight with him. I think he's really fearing for his life. That's a sugar, I know. And so he backs his truck out. And in getting away, he ran over one of his best friends. I think if you were a white music executive and you happen to go out to the site to see this movie, some guy comes up and starts to beat up on you and you happen to run over somebody, your defense would be self-defense and people would believe it and you wouldn't go to jail. If you should, it's gonna be first degree murder. Think of the, the person in the mirror that guy has to look at. How do you go from hundreds of millions of dollars to prison and it's just your fault because you chose to be something you you didn't have to be and right now he's got to be in a place where he understands that all those things led him there i forgive him for the hurt that he's caused me even though he's never asked for forgiveness, even though he's never talked about it, because I know that he's not man enough to talk about it. Sometimes when you hurt people, you're not man enough to talk about it. It's kind of hard to say, I've done you wrong. So I forgive him in advance. I wouldn't give a damn what, what gangster you name. You know, it all ends in this, at the same place. Your light is bright, your glory was a flash. And now you're just in a world of <laughs> It's Shug that's got to face you. was lost but now I am found